أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من همزه ونفخه ونفخه اسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة وبركاته um, We are going to start with some questions So how is your weekend? How do you determine capital T truths to then align them or to, to then align your small T truths, lowercase T truths with the capital T truths? And how do your feelings relate to whatever you choose as your lowercase T truths? Notice I use the word choose. Okay, so we're going to continue this and we're going to think about this a little bit more. It's a thought experiment. So we're going to continue with exploring certain things. Um, remember the question that I asked over here? They do align with what the, the stuff that we're going to be doing today. So just pay attention to that, but they also align naturally with this stuff right here. So keep that in mind. All right, game time. <clears throat> Go ahead. Next one. Um, bottom left. Bottom left is choosing what we do. drug reduces the risk of heart attacks by 40%. Shark attacks are up by a factor of two. Drinking a liter of soda per day doubles your chance of developing cancer. These are all examples of relative risk, a common way risk is presented in news articles. Risk evaluation is a complicated tangle of statistical thinking and personal preference. One common stumbling block is the difference between relative risks like these and what are called absolute risks. Risk is the likelihood that an event will occur. It can be expressed as either a percentage, for example, that heart attacks occur in 11% of men between the ages of 60 and 79, or as a rate that one in two million divers along Australia's western coast will suffer a fatal shark bite each year. These numbers express the absolute risk of heart attacks and shark attacks in these groups. Changes in risk can be expressed in relative or absolute terms. For example, a review in 2009 found that mammography screenings reduced the number of breast cancer deaths from 5 women in 1,000 to 4. The absolute risk reduction was about 0.1% but the relative risk reduction from five cases of cancer mortality to four is 20%. Based on reports of this higher number, people overestimated the impact of screening. To see why the difference between the two ways of expressing risk matters, let's consider the hypothetical example of a drug that reduces heart attack risk by 40%. Imagine that out of a group of a thousand people who didn't take the new drug, 10 would have heart attacks. The absolute risk is 10 out of 1,000, or 1%. If a similar group of 1,000 people did take the drug, the number of heart attacks would be 6. In other words, the drug could prevent 4 out of 10 heart attacks, a relative risk reduction of 40%. Meanwhile, the absolute risk only dropped from 1% to 0.6%, but the 40% relative risk decrease sounds a lot more significant. Surely preventing even a handful of heart attacks or any other negative outcome 
is worthwhile, isn't it? Not necessarily. The problem is that choices that reduce some risks can put you in the path of others. Suppose the heart attack drug caused cancer in one half of 1% of patients. In our group of 1,000 people, four heart attacks would be prevented by taking the drug, but there would be five new cases of cancer. The relative reduction in heart attack risk sounds substantial, and the absolute risk of cancer sounds small, but they work out to about the same number of cases. In real life, everyone's individual evaluation of risk will vary depending on their personal circumstances. If you know you have a family history of heart disease, you might be more strongly motivated to take a medication that would lower your heart attack risk, even knowing it provided only a small reduction in absolute risk. Sometimes we have to decide between exposing ourselves to risks that aren't directly comparable. If, for example, the heart attack drug carried a higher risk of a debilitating but not life-threatening side effect like migraines rather than cancer, our evaluation of whether that risk is worth taking might change. And sometimes there isn't necessarily a correct choice. Some might say even a minuscule risk of shark attack is worth avoiding because all you'd miss out on is an ocean swim, while others wouldn't even consider skipping a swim to avoid an objectively tiny risk of shark attack. For all these reasons, risk evaluation is tricky at baseline, and reporting on risk can be misleading, especially when it shares some numbers in absolute terms and others in relative terms. Understanding how these measures work will help you cut through some of the confusion and better evaluate risk. There is over here they were talking about how there was a difference between um, how it, uh, like the, maybe the, the authors of the studies intended versus how it was reported in public. So there is this thing where popular science um, it is a sort of doctored, not, not doctored, I don't want to say doctored, I want to say um, it's, it's, a, um, it's a version of science that wasn't necessarily how it was presented or bounded by the study authors and so on. So the way that it's been translated for the public to be able to have some access um, to it is, is it can be a little bit misleading sometimes. So just being careful about that is very important. So usually um, for me, I, I like to go back to the actual study itself instead of reading from articles and stuff or summaries of you know whatever it might be. So I'll go back and I'll, I'll look at the actual study if I can find it. And I'll say, okay, this is, you know, this is what they, they, they said, this is what they were looking at, this is what they were not looking at, this is what they were able to find, this is what they said as well, are the limitations, this is what they mentioned about the efficacy of some, some aspect of the study or like the, the, the treatment or whatever, and so on. So I'll, I'll kind of look at it from the author's perspective themselves and so on, so then I don't get confused by what it seems to be the case um, through popular science uh, outlets, essentially. And not to say that they're trying to manipulate stuff or whatever, but to say that there can be a lot of mis misunderstanding because of simply how we understand, like how individual people understand certain things. So um, just keeping that in mind helps us understand how, um, how how to avoid getting that kind of confusion and so on. Okay, next one. Uh, bottom right. Okay. Let's say you're on a game show. Ready earned $1,000 in the first round when you land on the bonus space. Now you have a choice. You can either take a $500 bonus, guaranteed, or you can flip a coin. If it's heads, you win a $1,000 bonus. If it's tails, you get no bonus at all. In the second round, you've earned $2,000 when you land on the penalty space. Now you have another choice. You can either take a $500 loss or try your luck at the coin flip. If it's heads, you lose nothing. But if it's tails, you lose $1,000 instead. If you're like most people, you probably chose to take the guaranteed bonus in the first round and flip the coin in the second round. But if you think about it, this makes no sense. The odds and outcomes in both rounds are exactly the same. So why does the second round seem much scarier? The answer lies in a phenomenon known as loss aversion. 
Under rational economic theory, our decisions should follow a simple mathematical equation that weighs the level of risk against the amount at stake. But studies have found that for many people, the negative psychological impact we feel from losing something is about twice as strong as the positive impact of gaining the same. No, this is also important because a person who has a negative experience, is, uh, it's a lot harder for them to let go of that experience, even with positive experiences, to kind of replace that. So um, I, I believe one of the studies that I mentioned before, they had mentioned that it, at least you need for every negative experience you've had, you need at least two positive experiences to counter that, at least two positive, meaning in, in many cases, it might not be, you might need more, three or four or five to counter the negative one, the one negative experience that you had. Now also in this case over here, understanding here is that sometimes we don't want to let go of our, uh, some of our lowercase t truths because we're afraid of what we're going to potentially miss out on. So Iblis, for example, when he didn't make sense that to Adam uh, you know, as, as, as the um, angels were commanded him, he was one of, the, one of the jinn that was placed among the angels. Uh, he didn't want to. And for him, he felt that if I do make sense that to him, that I'm going to lose my rank somehow or another. And so because of that, he didn't want to let go of his lowercase c truth. <laughs> so he didn't let go of his lowercase t truth because he was afraid of losing something. And so a lot of times you're going to find people have certain ideas and certain concepts that are not realistic and they might even be hurting themselves or they might even be hurting them. Uh, but they being uh, the, the ideas themselves might be hurting the person. But they still don't let it go because they feel like if I let go of this person or this thing or whatever, then somehow or another I'm going to have lost. But in fact, they are the ones that are, as long as they keep that uh, lowercase t truth sitting there in their head, they're the ones that are actually hurting constantly. Because remember I said, how, how, do, they, how do the feelings connect to our chosen truths? So as long as you keep a truth that is hurting you, it's going to stay there. And if you're not going to let go because you feel like if I let it go, am I ever going to be able to get whatever I want and stuff or whatever it is that I need and stuff without moving forward? So that, that makes you sort of stubborn or hesitant and actually removing something from yourself that is actually beneficial for you and you're actually going to more likely get whatever it is that you want um, or that you need at the end. Be it, you know. Same thing. Loss aversion is one cognitive bias that arises from heuristics. Problem-solving approaches based on previous experience and intuition, rather than... This is what we were talking about, the data points. If you remember, we mentioned like the individual data points that make our trend line, the line of best fit, and because of which we decide, you know, or according to which we decide how we're going to navigate future similar circumstances and so on. Careful analysis. And these mental shortcuts can lead to irrational decisions, not like falling in love or bungee jumping off a cliff but logical fallacies that can easily be proven wrong. Situations involving probability are notoriously bad for applying heuristics. For instance, say you were to roll a die with four green faces and two red faces 20 times. You can choose one of the following sequences of rolls, and if it shows up, you'll win $25. Which would you pick? In one study, 65% of the participants, who were all college students, chose sequence B, even though A is shorter and contained within B. In other words, more likely. This is what's called a conjunction fallacy. Here, we expect to see more green rolls, so our brains can trick us into picking the less likely option. Heuristics are also terrible at dealing with numbers in general. In one example, students were split into two groups, the first group was asked whether Mahatma Gandhi died before or after age nine, while the second was asked whether he died before or after age 140. Both numbers were obviously way off, but when the students were then asked to guess the actual age at which he died, the first group's answers averaged to 50, while the second group's averaged to 67. Even though the clearly wrong information in the initial questions should have been irrelevant, it still affected the students' estimates. This is an example of the anchoring effect, and it's often used in marketing and negotiations to raise the prices that people are willing to pay. So, if heuristics lead to all these wrong decisions, why do we even have them? 
Well, because they can be quite effective. For most of human history, survival depended on making quick decisions with limited information. Now, uh, over here, uh, I'm just going to extract from here only the part about making quick decisions, right? And that's it. So a lot of times we do, we do this. And a lot of times we start not actually thinking logically, we start thinking irrationally about what's working in our life, what's not working in our life, why it's not working and so on. And so we're actually taking shortcuts, but now we're, we're not actually looking at the bigger picture of things. We're not actually looking at things critically and evaluating every situation in its own context, right? Where we sort of try to pair things together. We try to make everything, you know, we just try to make it simpler, especially when we have different, you know, things on our mind and so on. Um, whether we chose those things to be on our mind, by not letting them go or because they just like we, we were just in a particular context where we had to assess multiple different things uh, and even in that situation whether we were organizing ourselves by priorities or we were not organizing ourselves at all and we're just sort of like letting everything kind of just pile up in our head and kind of like trying to figure out how to navigate that so just keep those things in mind the idea that we might try to take shortcuts like that just for quick decisions but how that can negatively impact us in terms of actually uh, evaluating situations that we might actually be in, right? So um, maybe a person feels that they made a mistake in something or maybe they're not good at something, whatever, whatever. And so they start sort of like um, assuming that they're not going to be good at anything else beyond that or whatever. And so they start actually thinking about things in a negative way, even though if a person actually sits down and breaks it down one by one by one, case by case by case, they're going to actually realize, wait, not, uh, I'm actually misunderstanding this entire dynamic. I'm misreading my whole situation and so on. When there's no time to logically analyze all the possibilities, heuristics can sometimes save our lives. But today's environment requires far more complex decision making. And these decisions are more biased by unconscious factors than we think, affecting everything from health and education to finance and criminal justice. We can't just shut off our brain's heuristics, but we can learn to be aware of them. When you come to a situation involving numbers, probability, or multiple details, pause for a second and consider that the intuitive answer might not be the right one after all. Challenge the past. Challenge. Okay, so this is the last one left. Here's a riddle my hobbits is. What's something that we all experience all the time that we can't really measure and barely have words to define? You can't hold it in your hand or take a bite out of it. It isn't something you learn or practice. It just is consciousness. Every science has certain concepts that are so fundamental yet abstract that we have a hard time finding the appropriate words to describe them. Ask a physicist and they'll tell you energy and space defy simple definitions. Biologists know if something is alive but have a harder time explaining what life actually is. Ask a psychologist what consciousness is, and you'll get you'll get a slippery answer. For the purposes of this conversation, we're going to actually loosely define consciousness as our awareness of ourselves and our environment. It's this awareness that allows us to take in and organize information from many sources and senses at once. American psychologist William James thought of consciousness as a continuously moving shift an unbroken stream, hence the term stream of consciousness. Others think of it as the brain's roving flashlight shining down an unbroken beam of light that highlights one thing then moves to the next. The point is your conscious experience is forever shifting. For example, right now, hopefully you're focused on the words coming out of my mouth, but with a little shift, your mind might wander to how you really should probably shower today and your chair is kind of uncomfortable and you suddenly have to be. And can you believe what Bernie said? Do I smell pizza? Hey, eyes here. We're learning. Beyond that moment-to-moment -moment shifting, consciousness allows us to contemplate life, think about infinity, and ride a unicycle across a tightrope while juggling melons, at least in theory. Our consciousness helps us plan our futures, consider consequences, and reflect on the past. It is both the most familiar and the most mysterious part of our lives. Kind of like the Force, but for the little universes inside our heads. <laughs> Throughout our daily lives, we flit back and forth between various states of consciousness, including waking, sleeping, and various altered states. These can occur spontaneously, like dreaming, or be physiologically sparked, like a drug-induced hallucination, or be triggered psychologically through meditation or hypnosis, for example. We're going to take the next three episodes to look closely at these different states of consciousness, but let's start with what it really means to be awake. For centuries, scientists learned what they could about the brain solely through clinical observation, and they learned a lot. For 
sure. But with today's technology, we're actually able to see some of the structures and activity inside a living, working brain. It's electrical, metabolic, and magnetic signatures displayed on screens for our wonder and amusement. The field of cognitive neuroscience is the study of how brain activity is linked with our mental processes, including thinking, perception, memory, and language. Like other kinds of neuroscience, it uses neuroimaging technologies to consider links between specific brain states and conscious experiences. And there's more than one way to scan a brain. Structural imaging shows the brain's anatomy and is useful in identifying large-scale tumors, diseases, and injuries. In contrast, functional imaging shows us electromagnetic or metabolic activity in the brain, like blood flow, to let us observe correlations between specific mental functions and activity in particular brain areas. So, yes, neuroimaging has been revolutionizing the field of psychology, much like telescopes and microscopes did for astronomy and biology. But on the other hand, some of this technology is very new, and there's plenty of disagreement about how to interpret neuroimaging findings. Remember, correlation does not equal causation, so activity in a certain brain region while having certain kinds of thoughts might be useful to know, but it's not the end of the conversation. We've already talked a lot about how function is often localized in the brain and how everything psychological is simultaneously biological, so it stands to reason our thoughts and emotions could in part be illustrated by a bright flare on a dark screen. We've also collected a fair amount of evidence that we don't just have one layer of consciousness, a single tape playing various tunes, but rather something more like two layers, each supported by its own personal bio psycho social pit crew. We're talking about one of the dual process models of consciousness. The idea that our conscious deliberate mind could be saying, look, a squirrel, while our implicit automatic mind is simultaneously sub-processing like a computer. Color, brown, tail, bushy, movement, climbing, distance, 20 meters, association. My sister had a squirrel phobia as a child. Implicit bias. I think that squirrels are ruining America, all of which might weigh upon my behavior upon seeing the little guy. By some estimates, all your different senses are scooping up nearly 11 million Million bits of information every second, and yet you consciously register only about 40 at a time. So how do we keep focused and filter out all that chatter to actually get stuff done? With selective attention, of course. Selective attention is how we focus our consciousness on one particular stimulus or group of stimuli, effectively tuning out the rest. Your consciousness is like a spotlight on a busy stage. There are other things going on around you that your automatic sub-processor brain is covertly registering, but for those moments when you shine your spotlight light, most of the other stimuli fall away. Try it at home! Right now, you're consciously watching this lesson on consciousness. You probably don't notice the feel of your socks on your feet or the tongue that's inside your mouth, always filling up your mouth with tongue, but as soon as I mention it and the spotlight of your attention turns to them, you feel those socks on your feet, and you're like, wow, it's weird that there's a tongue in my mouth. The classic auditory example of selective attention is the cocktail party effect. You could be in a room with 47 people jabbering away and yet be able to concentrate your hearing on one conversation, tuning out the rest of the voices and the background music, but if the couple next to you were to speak your name, suddenly your cognitive radar would light up and your attention would whip around to the sound of your name, probably trying to figure out if Bernice was talking behind your back again. Bernice! This roving spotlight of selective attention is pretty handy most of the time for spies and lay people alike, but it can also be dangerous if you're being dumb and, say, texting and driving. When you shift your primary selective attention from driving to OMG la 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 la, you also unwittingly activate your selective inattention, which means that you failed to see that cyclist who you almost ran over, which would not only have ruined her life, but also yours. So don't text and drive. In fact, when your full attention is directed elsewhere, you'd be astounded by the scope of obvious things you failed to notice. It's called inattentional blindness. You may have even already been subject to one of the most famous experiments of inattentional blindness, the invisible gorilla, or sometimes the moonwalking bear. Just Google either of those things if you want to be tested on your awareness, and then come back. <laughs> Pretty great, right? Given the prompt to count the number of passes one team makes, your consciousness is focused on following the players in the ball, nothing else. You don't see the players in black. They're the distraction. Also, you certainly don't see the dancing gorilla or bear, whichever one. The original version of this experiment found that about 50% of people didn't notice there was a gorilla 
walking through the room. That's how powerfully selective our attention can be. Something to remember next time you're behind the wheel. But you know who understands and exploits inattentional blindness better than anyone? Magicians. So they call it misdirection. Famous modern magician Teller of Penn and Teller says every time you perform a magic trick, you're engaging in experimental psychology. And we can't help but be the rubes. Magicians also prey on our change blindness, the psychological phenomenon in which we fail to notice changes in our environment. And no, I don't mean climate change. I mean the failure to recognize the difference between what was there a moment ago versus what is there now. For example, I have changed shirts several times since this lesson started. In a well-known and often copied experiment, sometimes called the person swap, an experimenter will stop someone in the park, ask for directions, and then during some staged interruption, the original experimenter will leave and be replaced with a totally different person. Half the time, the subject doesn't even notice. Fun! One of the many perks of studying psychology with me is you learn all kinds of new ways to mess with people. But while change blindness makes for some really cool parlor tricks, this failure to notice certain things can be dangerous. Say, when faulty memories lead to false eyewitness testimonies in court, or when friends get deadlocked in a he-said-she-said disagreement. So, my friends, use the Force, but use it wisely. As one of my favorite psychologists once advised, a Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. Actually, that was Yoda. Anyway, the bottom line is, we are far less aware of what's going on around us than we think we are, and that's just when we're awake. Imagine what might slip your notice when you're half asleep or drunk or hypnotized or hallucinating. That's what we're going to talk about next time. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course. If you were selectively conscious of my words, you got introduced to our constant struggle to define consciousness, learned a little bit about neuroimaging and its developing role in psychological science, how our consciousness is split into two pieces, deliberate and automatic, and how the brain can be selectively attentive, selectively inattentive, and blind to changes in some surprisingly major ways. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of Crash Course Psychology, get a copy of one of our Rorschach prints and even be animated into an upcoming episode, just go to subable.com slash crash course and subscribe. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, edited by Blake DiPastino, and our consultant is Dr. Ranji Bhagwat. Our director and editor is Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor is Michael Aranda, who is also our sound designer, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. Okay. So some thoughts to... have any thoughts on this, we can address them. I think it's when there's like a pile up of, um, the bad experiences and you don't recover with like the double amount of good experiences that would make them go away. Like that could be one of the contributing things. Okay. So one of the contributing things could be that maybe there are certain bad experiences that you had and you weren't able to resolve them yet, um, whether by going back and reanalyzing the situation to see if it was indeed negative or maybe there was something that you misunderstood or misperceived or by getting uh, getting positive experiences moving forward to offset your risk that your risk assessment essentially or um or, or your um relative risk uh, that you might be assuming about a certain situation what else what, what about something related to um this how do you feel yeah. go ahead the truths in your brain are aligned in a way that um like make things more negative than they are okay uh, where does the aspect of choice come in because you choose how to perceive it. So you have a choice in terms of what kind of truth you choose to accept? Yeah, that too. So for example, you might assume or you might choose to believe, um, and I'm saying choose 
because uh, you know if you if you actually go deeper into this you'll, you'll figure out that um, it's not implanted in our mind as in like it, it's been innate to us a lot of times we are the ones because of experiences because of what we heard here and there and so on allowed some information to settle into our minds our brains are already going to be doing that they, they, that's what they're designed for doing right so automatically they're going to get you sort of like trained like they're going to train themselves to kind of get used to circumstances and kind of make sure that you're able to navigate different situations however sometimes they can go wrong because if you were in a negative situation they will your brain can actually adapt to thinking that that's the normal situation this is how life looks like normally so it can, it can get impacted like that. So you have to understand how your environment can impact your brain and how environments of other people can impact their brains, whether they're children, whether it's you know, adults, whether they're living in a non-Muslim country, for example, whether they're living you know, isolated from other Muslims or others or whatever, whatever the situation looks like, right? How your environment can have an automated impact on you if you don't actually intervene manually or if you don't have certain circum you know, control factors or something to kind of help you um, in, in terms of making sure that the information coming in is it's correct information and it's not relative to whatever the situation you were in. As in, it's not, um, by, it doesn't give you certain biases that might not be capital T truths, essentially. They're, they, they become your lowercase t truths, but you think that they're capital T truths and all, everything looks like this, every other context looks like that. Um, so something like that. So just making sure that you can differentiate between context, between um, your perceptions because of a certain situation you're living in, versus how you know how other contexts might look look like. So a lot of times, people who were living in a certain society, they got used to that. And when other people were trying to come into that society from a different society, different background, different mindsets, and so on, people sort of had xenophobia. And this xenophobia can be very negative because. It has no basis, essentially, right? In the sense that not every person who comes from a different context, uh, you know, is bad. It's just that they're different. Different doesn't mean bad. And we, if we understand that, it makes it a lot easier for us to navigate. So a person who, for example, um, uh, because we're in, in like, you know, time for when people are celebrating and so on, just because we're in a situation where we are in a non-Muslim context, and everyone's celebrating Christmas and so on, um, just because we are not doing it, right? Does it make us like outsiders, or does it make us like bad people, or whatever and stuff? And if we're not, and we're not telling them that, we're not, we're not giving them, we're not giving them greetings of like Merry Christmas or whatever. We're not saying those things. Then it, it doesn't make us uh, bad because different doesn't mean bad. Because at the same time. We don't get upset at them so, the, so they're not going to get upset th at us if we don't say a merry christmas because we don't get upset at them when they don't say like aid mubarak or something like that right because we understand they're just different people different different contexts different you know, like mindsets or whatever and that's that so in some cases difference doesn't mean bad um, in some cases it can mean bad but i'm not saying i'm saying that it's not like it's not the, the rule that difference is bad so just keeping that in mind over here that sometimes people get used to certain things and they get really worried uh, if, if a new group of people comes in or if they're in a different context themselves, they worry that if they don't fit into that context, then somehow they're going to be bad or whatever and stuff. So that doesn't make sense. That's not how this works, right? So just keep that in mind. So capital T truth, we need to determine those. Lowercase t truth is what we are often run with, but they don't necessarily equate. So what happens over here oftentimes is we end up coming up with these lowercase t truths that we think are capital T truths. Then we assess ourselves with this uh, set of lowercase t truths, which I'm going to call the rubric. And when we realize that our, you know, whatever situation we're in is not matching exactly how uh, capital T truths should be, or, or like whatever is actually happening in real life, our lowercase t truths based rubric is not, uh, is not, uh, or, or, okay, let me rephrase this. Whatever situation we're in, we evaluate it relative to our rubric, whatever we selected as our rubric, or whatever we allowed for our rubric to be. And if we fail, if we, for whatever the circumstances, whatever the situation, if it fails, the criteria that was in our lowercase c truth, we consider that a failure. Is that really a failure? Well, it depends. 
Why does it depend? It depends on whether the rubric was based on capital T truth or if it was based on something other than that, which we thought was capital T truth. Because we, we, we considered ourselves or the situation as a failure, we're going to have fa feelings of failure associated with that assessment. And if we keep on doing this over and over again, we could go into deep depression. Now, I need to say this, that medically, scientifically, they don't have a way, like they haven't yet determined what the actual causes of uh, depression is. From an Islamic perspective, from a non-medical, non-scientific perspective, you know, we, we believe that we have this understanding, like, clarity in this matter and that it goes deeper and that is that a person having the wrong understanding of how the life actually works uh, can have an impact on that but medically speaking scientifically speaking they don't have that so if you go to a therapist if you go to a psychiatrist they're going to explore your history but they cannot actually tell you what the cause of your depression is and that's why they don't cure when you go to these people don't go there thinking that they're going to cure you go there for treatment treatment is um like you get treated for something for the symptoms that you that are appearing but they're not um they're not necessarily curing you as in they're not fixing the cause of the situation so for example if you have um, if you're looking at a lion and i think i mentioned this example before but let me reiterate that here if you look if you look at a lion and you had a you had a rubric that in your mind that um lions you have to run away from otherwise they're going to eat you right so as soon as you see them you're going to have a fear response because your 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 accepted truth your chosen truth was run away from a lion otherwise it'll eat you so as soon as you see it your body remembers that rule that you selected for yourself that piece of information that you believe to be true it'll say okay based on this if you're saying that this is what i need to believe okay in that case you're telling me that i need to activate my uh you know my, my flight response so this is where I'm going to activate that response and then your, 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 your brain sends out signals and so on and your endocrine system activates as well So um, because of the brain telling it's sending a signal and so now the uh, now adrenaline starts flowing through your body and so on and then you start you feel like you can run now, right? So you can do like your know, extraordinary feats because of this. So you, you might run. But on the other hand, a person who sees a lion and they have a rule that, hey, let me pet the lion. Lions don't bite. They're not going to hurt you unless you attack them or whatever, right? In that case, you might go and try to pet the, animal, pet, pet the lion. And you're not going to have the same response because your brain had a different rule to run with. A different rule on which to process, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. So that the instructions is getting based on the new rule, based on the second rule or the other rule that, you know, that you can pet the animal is that don't be scared. This is just something that you can go to and you might actually feel excited that you can pet the animal. So the brain response is going to be very different based on whatever truth that you chose to accept. And I say choose because you can always go back and edit that and say, wait, why am I thinking like that? That's not true. This is not right. This is, you know, and, or if, if you get new information and stuff, you're constantly adjusting and stuff, right? So in both, in both cases, even though they're the exact same situation, you're still seeing, you both people are looking at the lion, right? But because of the rule that they chose to accept, they're both going to have different reactions. Their brains are going to have different reactions. In one case, it's going to be extreme stress and fear and all that, right? So your brain activity is going to look different. Your, your chemical reactions and your chemical processes are going to look very different in the brain. Your electric processes are going to look very different. Everything's going to look different in the brain. In the two brains, even though they're experiencing the same exact situation. And so in a case of, you know, in, in, if let's say a person has a lot of like stress or worry, or they might they might have grown into a context where people are just sort of like very you know tough on you and so on, then they're gonna have anxiety. They're gonna have stage fright and so on. When they get in front of people, people were laughing at them in the past or whatever. They made mistakes. People were insulting them or whatever. So they're gonna have anxiety and stress and all that. So when they go in the stage next time, they're gonna have that fear. It's the same situation as another person who didn't have that same you know like uh, that that line of best fit or that lowercase c truth but it's just the reaction is very different and so this is where i can say go back and say wait no i don't care if people laugh at me or not if something i gotta do i'm gonna do it that's it right or i can train the person by having new data points by having them actually witness other people that are not gonna laugh at them they're actually very supportive and stuff and suddenly things are gonna change 
So your mindset is very important over here. Whatever you choose as your lower care, as your capital T truths, um, or your lowercase t truths that you think are capital T truths, is going to have an impact on how your brain reacts to that, uh, to a particular context and situations. And in the, in one case, that anxiety might debilitate you, and that uh, that fear might debilitate you, and so you get medication for that because your brain is sort of having this this thing about like don't go there because it hurts you. Don't go there, it, it hurts you because that's the memory, right? Don't go in front of the audience because they'll laugh at you and that's gonna hurt you. Don't go there, so it's kind of a good deterrent. So your brain is trying to help you out here. But on the other hand, um, it can, it, from another perspective, it's actually causing you anxiety. So the medication that's given is to treat that symptom of, like let's say, let's say in this case, um, let's say there's like you know, a lot of uh, chemical processes that are taking place that are representative of a person that is having a certain like a flight or like a fear or like a fight or flight response, right? Versus um, another person who doesn't have that. So between the two people, one of them has a reaction that we want to like we have a, you know a brain a state that we need to uh, change so that it looks like the person who doesn't have that um, anxiety in or a stage fright in front of the people. So they'll give you medication to address those particular things. So your brain now, at least temporarily, is going to look like whatever it is that the other person looks like. And so suddenly you're going to feel calmer and so on and so on. And as soon as the medication wears off, you need another you know, dose of it. So you're going to keep on taking that medication just to keep on making sure that you can navigate whatever it is that you need to navigate without getting uh, impacted by anxiety. But that doesn't actually cure the issue. It doesn't actually fix the cause of whatever it is that's causing you there. So keeping that in mind, a lot of, and I'm saying this only, I'm not saying to tell people not to go to therapists and so on, but I am saying this because I don't want, uh, you know, I, I want to make it clear to people that sometimes they go there with a the misunderstanding that this therapist is supposed to cure them. And if they don't cure them, they're going to give up on like uh, mental health, you know, care, for example. They're just going to give up and say, nobody was able to help me. And they're going to go into deeper depression and stuff. So expectations are very important. Um, I actually had a conversation with, uh, with somebody on one of the cases um, just this morning. And I mentioned the same thing to them. And I asked them, you know, what is your expectation going to a therapist? The therapist that this person is already going to, what is your expectation? And they, they, they were saying that, you know, that this person is going to fix me. And I said, but that's not how therapists work. Like, it doesn't work that way, right? They're going to treat you, but they can't fix you. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? No, they, they have to fix me. I'm going to them, they have to fix me. So they have to, like, make things, they make whatever it is that I'm going through go away. So this person was sort of, like, delegating that control to somebody else who doesn't have that control and not, is not going to be able to do anything because you have a choice in what you want to do or not to do at the end of the day. So in this case, keep that, keep that very clear that therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists are trying to help you as much as they can, right? And they, they, they're they trying to figure out, you know, as much as they can how to help you. And they'll give you medication and all that stuff to help you so that you're not debilitated. You're able to function and do the things that, you know, other people are doing with the same brain functioning, you know, essentially. Um, even if they're not actually giving you tools because they, they, they can they don't have let's say scientifically confirmed guarantee of like what causes depression and so on and so what is going to cure it but nonetheless they'll give you some tips and so on and pointers and stuff so definitely it's going to help you actually live your life and function properly um, but don't go there with the expectation that you're going to be cured and perfectly fine and stuff like that because that can actually get you deeper into depression when it doesn't happen like that so again that is your lowercase t truth and it's not capital t truth so that's the reason I mentioned that over here. So I hope this made sense. Um, I hope this gives you some insight about how to navigate these circumstances and how to help yourself um, or help, help in a way prevent some of these things from manifesting into uh, conditions that may end up leading to debilitation and so on in terms of you being able to have, you know, live life and so on. Does anybody have any comments? Any thoughts or reflections or anything? Actually, yesterday I had two cases, two new cases. And there was another case that was an ongoing case. Uh, so there's two ongoing cases, two new cases, and a third case today in the morning. So that was uh, like early uh, Fudge time or something. So that's like 
three new cases and two ongoing cases and all of them um or at least like uh let's see i think four of them no three of them three of them out of the five they were they started off because people thought they needed to have rukia done on them like rukia islamic rukia they thought that they needed to get that done and the two of them just didn't know what to do and so they were really overwhelmed and so on um, and so that was that so anyways three of them uh, actually but all five of them all five of them have the same underlying root issue and that is feeling of inadequacy and incompetence and so on and this is just in the last like you know like just yesterday um all of these things and uh, this is to show like how prevalent this is that sometimes or a lot of times in here your rubric is the one that needs to be adjusted and because of that uh, because if it's not adjusted currently it's not matching the capital t truth reality then you're feeling you know incompetent you feel like you know i'm doing all these things it's not working out and, and like i'm a failure i'm not feeling good about myself i feel like i you know i'm like i'm just not worth it and stuff and like you know i'm just you know like failure essentially but you know when they actually go back and say wait a minute maybe my my rubric is actually wrong and i'm using the wrong answer key to judge you know to grade myself and that's why i keep failing but if i use the right rubric then i'm not gonna fail any longer and so when they might start doing that then they can start feeling that okay oh wait yeah i didn't fail i am a competent person i am not a failure and so on and suddenly everything starts changing i think it's very easy like in the age of social media to feel inadequate just because you see everything good out of so many people like everything they want to show to the public you see it from them and like even from tv you see so much good things from people but you don't see uh reality like i've seen, there's so many times where like i've come across someone who like i thought like they had no issues at all but then i found out something about them and it completely changed my perception yeah there was a case where um somebody was mentioning to me that they looked at other people um they looked at their friends they looked at you know like the, their peers they looked at other people and their lives were like perfect they had everything going for them right and they just you know they were hoping that their life would actually end up being the same like they would you know they would also get like good life and whatever right but then i actually happened to know some of those people and i actually happened to know some of the like the background behind those you know those families and stuff and like the inside stuff or whatever I happen to know some of those things. And so I said, you know, just because it appears that way doesn't actually mean that this is exactly what's happening. I know behind the scenes stuff from each of those people that was that were mentioned and I think most of them if I each of them and I said that it's not what it looks like. It's really good that they're trying to hide all that stuff. You know, they're not like making a public information and stuff and like you know just like complaining about it to everyone. and i'm not saying that this person was complaining because they actually they tried to seek help and stuff right there and that was all there they don't want to complain to anyone but what i'm saying is in this case you know a lot of people hide things really well but in reality they are actually having the same kinds of issue that we might be having and stuff and so it's not that they're not having the issues it's that we thought they're not having issues and that's why we figured that hey i should not also have issues and stuff too but that was that was wrong because they were having issues and that was a reality so you, you know if that's how the reality works then that's what's going to happen to you too so you're not failing because that's your rubric is wrong and just fix the rubric and as soon as you do that then you start seeing like the huge difference in your life and yeah so that that's that's that, that's a good point over here Anything else? Okay, so um, one more thing is this. <clears throat> Non-Muslims oftentimes 
uh, and Muslims included, right? But I'm talking about from like from an Islamic perspective, like Islam. So Islam uh, gives us capital T truths, and it, we cut to the taste, right? But non-Muslims or the non-Muslim world, essentially, may not have that access. May not have that access, and they may not accept that that information. So they end up taking um, whatever that they think is right, and you know the new political the new political arena is that we don't um, we 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 cannot say another person is necessarily wrong, it morally, because everyone is allowed to have their own moral sense, and everyone is therefore right, and if that's the case, then people get confused. And people are overwhelmed because you can't really help person help a person and say like okay well you actually have a misunderstanding here because this is how it's supposed to be because that person like no it, it can be whatever I want it to be like right so this is the confusion that people so this is the confusion that a lot of times happens so with that um, I just wanted to conclude with that that a lot of times this is the this is the dilemma that we live in. Everyone, you know, in a context where there's no single standard of morality and what's right and wrong and so on, then everyone is allowed to do whatever they want to do. Uh, they're, they're allowed to have whatever moral system that they want to have, whatever right and wrong that they think should be the case, they're allowed to have. So a lot of times it can lead to confusion and that con that confusion can really overwhelm a person because they think this is how it should be, but they had no like, you know, establishment. There's no like, substance with other on top of which they're establishing whatever they're establishing so it's just something to keep in mind that a lot of times because people don't have a standard to go back and get their capital t truth and this is with this question right here if they don't have a place to go and actually identify capital t truths because everyone is allowed to have their own truths and consider them as capital t truths then it can be so overwhelming and frustrating and just just overall debilitating and that means that person is not able to move forward and um, na navigate different contexts effectively. So when you see situations like that, and uh, you know, unfortunately, um, many of our Muslims uh, are also facing the same reality because they're living in you know a context where this is really prevalent. So we can't really say that you know they, they should have they should know this on their own and so on. So we really have to go back and um, really address the fundamental issue over here so that we can actually have a positive impact on a lot of people. When people have the wrong uh, understanding of how reality looks like or life works, uh, then they're gonna get confused because they're gonna they're gonna put their goals and their plans according to lowercase t truths that don't actually align with capital T truths. And when they keep on failing because life actually works differently, then they're gonna eventually internalize that and they're gonna feel like I'm not good enough, uh, and so on. And uh, as I was saying, in the five thing in the five cases, I guess a little bit over the last 24 hours um, in these five cases that came up um, all of them had the same uh, dynamic going on and so uh, and, and th I think I, said, I think I said three right two or three I think three of those cases actually were initiated with Rukia they were asking for Rukia um, there's another one actually um, uh, I got a call for today and I need to get back to them um, they, get, they got busy but anyways so in this case they're asking for Rukia again um, and again, it might be that I called them and I talked to them, and it may not be Rukhya or this stuff, it might be something like this. So just, just some things to keep in mind that, you know, it's a very prevalent thing. People um, may not have an understanding of how this works, but I hope that some of the stuff that we talked about today and the videos that we watched um, are going to be effective and useful, inshallah, for you to work with, inshallah. Any, any comments or questions? I know um, somebody else joined in right now, so... Uh, the, the recording is going to be online, inshallah, so you can see that later. But in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, then let me know, inshallah. And for this question right here, we've been working on it for a few weeks. Um, can you go back to the uh, video with the, or the slide with the videos on it, so I could just see the titles and look at them later? Yeah, you see them? Yeah, got it. I'm going to stop the share.